All right, good. So we're live. We have people. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the um, Plus Us. So uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, today we're here to discuss how to add a Bitcoin BTM to your business, um, some of the differences between what an operator is, what a partner is. Um, and today we have with us Eric Grill, our CEO, Keith Smith, our sales director, Mike Salvi. Um, that's me. They can give me an introduction if you want, but I'm the uh, I'm the face of Chainbytes. So, um, and typically when you call in, you either talk to me or somebody else. So, welcome everybody. Any questions that you have, post in the chat, and uh, we'll get to you. So, let's start with a BTM business. How to add one to your business, and how can you fit it into your current business? So, for a lot of people that have heard about Bitcoin and the Bitcoin ATM business, and just a boom, or um. You know, we've been getting a lot of questions about what is it, how to add it to their business. So we decided to put this together. So, Eric, you want to get started? Sure. Um, well, first, you got to decide how much of the business you want to get involved in. Uh, and, and like you mentioned in the opening, um, you can either be an operator, you can be a partner, or you can just host the machine. And, and there's different options. We have other operators who, who partner with people and put machines into them. Um, but if you want to do the full business and create the business, do the compliance, do the cash management, do everything, uh, then you'll be an operator. And, and so that, that's that one model. Um, so, that, so back to the, to the ATM industry, the way that it works today, uh, none of them would be considered an operator. They would all be partners because they partner with a payment processor on the back end and then a bank that does, does all their um, processing. So in this case, um, they have to do a little bit more with Bitcoin ATMs as an operator. And then, of course, hosting is I have location. I want to you know, rent out some space. And there's plenty of operators looking for good locations. Yep. And so <clears throat> most uh, like our customers that are existing ATM operators in the legacy ATM business, uh, most of them want to become full time operators. They want to operate their own Bitcoin ATMs. And that way they maximize the amount of profit they can make. Some of them don't want to. Some are looking for somebody to partner with, somebody that, you know, hey, I'll buy the Bitcoin ATM, uh, you, you operate it for me, and I'll, I have all these locations already secured because I have these clients, and this way I can make mo more money and not have to focus too much into this business. Uh, and then the other way is if you're a host, a host is, you know, the, the gas station, the mini mark, mom, pop shop, and they just, they're uh, renting out the square footage for the ATM to be uh, placed at. One, one of the advantages I'd say ATM operators have over uh, other people that we've seen, uh, they have a head start. They already have locations. They have machines and locations. They know how to get locations. They understand cash logistics. They understand a lot of the parts of the business that, that others will struggle with. Um, so for them, it's an easy transition. Most of the people who are in the ATM business, you know, back in the day, that was an innovative business. That was something, you know, on the bleeding edge of getting into. And so a lot of the people that transition from there, again, it, it's, it's sort of that same mindset getting into this. So this is the next transition, um, in, you know, in the ability to make money there. I don't know what else to say about Just waiting for the train to go by. Um, okay, so <laughs> in choosing a Bitcoin ATM manufacturer, um, what does somebody look for? Two things. Uh, what, one is the business itself and one is the, the product. Um, so the business, you want to be able to call and talk to them and, and help you out with your business. Um, you, you'll find that lacking in this industry. Uh, you know, they may just sell you the machine and best of luck to you. And yeah, good luck, because uh, especially in the United States with regulations, you know, you should be talking to them about compliance, having them help you with this stuff, the things that you're going to have to go through as an operator so you succeed. Um, and then, of course, the product itself. You should be able to look at the product. You should either uh, be able to see and feel the machine. You should be able to use the dashboard. If they don't want to show it to you, you know, we just had this address today. A bunch of people got ripped off from an ATM manufacturer. They didn't even have a machine. Like and these people are, are buying the software and buying their hardware and spent lots of money and they were just getting ripped off. Um, check them out. Like check out the software. Check out how these things work. So, those two things. Are yeah, you 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 want you you want a machine that's built well. And the reason for that is you don't want your machine to go down, but you also want it coupled with software that's built well, because you don't want your machine to go down. You want this machine to stay operational. And you also want someone that's going to back you up. Somebody that's going to be there 
to ensure that you stay operational and works with you to stay operational. Uh, somebody that considers you like a partner. And that's what we do. We, we consider that our customers are an extension of us. So if you're, not, if you're not doing well, then we're not doing well. And so we're incentivized and we, we take pride in taking care of our customers. And that's why our, our, you don't have to wait days for our customer support to respond. Customer support's there because we support our customers. Well, for Chainbytes, it's built into the software. So like literally, um, there's a help menu inside the system. You can look for it. If it's not in there, you can open a ticket, um, which will immediately go to the support and they'll respond right away. I mean, you can call email, um, but most people find it easy just within the application since the question is probably related to there. Click, you know, ask the question and then get a response. Again, you know, feel it around. Go around to the different manufacturers and talk to them and, and see what kind of response you get. If the, and that's going to be a response when you have problems. And if they don't call you back to sell you a machine, imagine what happens after they sell it to you. So be, be careful. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what are the daily operations of the ETM operator. <laughs> main making, making, making sure they don't run out of Bitcoin. Um, you know, so so the main thing is cash logistics. So you watch your machines, A, that they're online, that they're performing properly, um, that, that the cash going in. Uh, most of your day is going to be customer support. Uh, people coming to the machine, ha helping them set up a wallet, first time at the machine, not understanding how to do something at the machine and, and calling you and helping them with that. So you do a lot of that stuff, um, you know, compliance related, and then, you know, picking up the cash, turning it back into Bitcoin. That's pretty much it after the business itself is running. The upfront work is, you know, obviously you get your compliance going, you get your banking going, you get, you know, your, your, your logistics is your, um, your internet, your power, your redundancies that are going to be on site, your lease agreements, things like that. Um, but once it's operational, it's pretty much uh, autopilot and scales very well. Okay, so with these, so maintenance, daily operations, um, you mentioned compliance too. So how does the software itself play into all that and the machines? So initially you get a compliant, you, you put your compliance into the software and set it up, say, hey, this is what we view as a risk assessment. This is going to be our compliance program. So the machine takes care of most of the checkpoints there, collecting the ID, collecting the SMS, collecting the social security, whatever it is that's in your compliance program. It's going to, you put it in there, it will do most of that work, and then you'll get um, either you or your compliance officer, or whoever's reviewing the transactions, will get a list of transactions that they would need to review for whatever reasons that it went over a certain threshold. Again, it depends on your AML policy. Um, but but you put it in there, it gets implemented, and um, that's it. I mean, uh, you work with, we work with a compliance company. Um, you know, if you're proficient in compliance and you know how to file SARS and CTRs and you know what you're looking for for structuring and other you know, money laundering and scams and things like that. Uh, you can do it yourself. All the software is in the tool. Our, da our dashboard has everything in it that you need in order to do your OFAC checks, your, um, you know, your, your clearing of transactions. So everything's built in. Okay. So as far as uh, compliance practices like related to the different types of Bitcoin ATM business that you choose, can we talk about that? Um, what what like, types what of things you set up? So you, you said that the operator... Sorry, you said that the operator. Sorry, you said that the operator set it up themselves and they put up. Well, the no, they have a compliance program. So, so the way you come with a compliance program, you work with a compliance officer who will do a risk assessment based upon the money laundering threat of your machine, um, and then you implement your program. So that would mean at this, at these locations, you know, we need a government ID at zero dollars. Yada yada yada. That that could be potentially a, um, you know, their money laundering program. So whatever that is, it it, it differs from location equation and operator and operator and based on risk assessment on the compliance side. Okay. Um, a <clears throat> couple questions that are coming in. Um, for, the that part, to for the most part, they're the same. I mean, m most people are, you know, it's lightweight, zero to $500, probably nothing, 500 to a thousand SMS over a thousand government ID. Um, but it depends on the operator. Some operators I see do it at $0 grabbing SMS so they can track them um, better. The more you collect earlier on, the easier it is to track. Um, so it's, again, it's up to the operator, their risk assessment. Okay. Um, so as far as starting a new business, um, obviously marketing is a big deal. So what are some of the best practices when it comes to marketing? Um, well, it, you obviously want to get listed on CoinATM radar. That's free. 
Um, <clears throat> some people use Coin ATM radar as a way to see that your machine's actually in operation because they're used to many operators having machines listed that are not actually operational. So they'll show up to a location and there there either won't be an ATM there or it'll be in maintenance mode because it's full of cash or they're out of Bitcoin. And so they don't want to waste their time. They want to make sure, hey, if I go to this ATM, will it work? So, you know, that's a good way to get customers. And it is a way to get customers. Um, having a website, okay? So people can find it. Building the SEO for your ATMs. SEO is your search engine optimization on like Google search engines and whatnot. So people type in your local town, where to buy Bitcoin. You want your ATM to pop up. But you're, you're going to need a website and kind of like a brand name to go behind that. But what you're really branding here is Bitcoin. People are looking for Bitcoin. So that's what you're marketing. Another way that you can market your machines is uh, our machines come with an additional, it, it, it's an option. Uh, it's an additional option. But you can get an additional screen on top. And that makes the ATM stand out more. And you can put a little slideshow on there. It says, you know, best Bitcoin ATM in town, buy Bitcoin here. And it catches people's mm -hmm. eyes. Another, another thing that you can do, outdoor advertising. With outdoor advertising, you just place signs outside and, you know, signs work. If they didn't work, politicians wouldn't use them. And you wouldn't see signs all over the place every election day. They work. They catch people's eyes. So if you get a flashy sign that catches people's they're eyes, almost, they keep on. And, and yeah, return on investment. They're our most effective tool. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's it's the outsourced signs are definitely the, the most effective tool. So you what I heard best bang for the buck. So what I hear from the both of you, uh, Eric, you mentioned your day, you know, a good chunk of your day is a, uh, well, not even a good chunk of your day, but um, you're concentrating on customer service and support. And Keith, you mentioned marketing, um, <clears throat> which, you know, for a lot of people listening, this is brand new to them, but uh, to hear that, and I don't mean to oversimplify that it's just, if you understand sales and marketing, and if you understand, you know, basic business practices that you could just come over here and, you know, in a month, you're going to get a truckload of money delivered to your house. Um, that being said, I mean, that's what, that's what most, you know, and some of the questions that are coming in and we are going to get to them. Um, we're just addressing them uh, in order. Um, but you know, that seems to be. What customer most support. Are customer support. support is really important. Um, it's, it's different because in traditional ATMs, there's no customer support really. So you don't have to, you don't have to worry about people calling you unless there's some kind of, you know, big, you know, horrible reason that they're calling you with Bitcoin ATMs. You have to, you have to expect to provide customer support. And what you're going to be dealing with is people calling you up saying, well, how do I use your machine? Well, you have to download a Bitcoin wallet. Then you just have to walk them through the process, which is a simple 10-minute process of downloading a Bitcoin wallet uh, and pick a nice, simple Bitcoin wallet for them and then scanning it on the machine, put the money in and everything. And you just walk them through that process. Once they get through that process, they're not going to call you again to ask them to go through that process. But now they know how well, they to might. do it from your machine. <laughs> Okay. Well, they might, yeah, but they they, they might be the second, third time. Depends. It's quite. A, we, we get we get some slow learners, but yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, well, yeah. It depends on the individual. But what you've done is you've now go, you've got them through the step of using your machine. They don't have to go through that step again, and they don't want to go try somewhere else. And they're this is how you snowball your now. customer base. Yeah, and they're the, comfortable. And they're not, even, not going anywhere else. That that's that's how you capture them. Is really they come in and. You know, they learn on your machine and they don't they don't want to go to to another machine let online you know that's why they came there in the first place so we yeah, were always there's wondering a, early there's on like unit. who who is our customer like who 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 would be and and, it, and turning turned out to not be the people we would necessarily think they were they were traditional people older people that used atms that may not have AT, had had atms when they were younger even and so atms were a big transition but they 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 got that so a lot of them are very comfortable with that and that that's a lot of our business is, is people that are comfortable with that um, and not comfortable going online and providing their banking information. And we were kind of shocked to, to see that we figured it'd be young people. Um, no, it's, it's kind of middle or middle, middle age people. So, go, so with that being, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead and ask those questions. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, well, with that being said, I mean, with the types of people that, uh, that do end up coming here, where are the most profitable locations? And that's, Everybody Obviously, that's that. most people I, I wish I had a magic wand. Always, right. <laughs> One of our competitors has a has a piece of software that apparently can pick the most profitable location. But um, yeah, it it, it really um, convenience, right? You're selling convenience, so a convenience convenient. store, obviously, 
um, malls. You know, people are always like, oh, I want to put it in a mall. I want to put it in a grocery store. Yeah, not really. Um, people are coming there for one purpose, and that's to use the machine. So you want to make it as easily and accessible as possible. So again, where your traditional ATMs are, that's probably a good location because you've already placed it in a location for convenience. You're selling the same convenience. So I would uh, I, I would put it in convenience stores next to an ATM machine. We've put them in gun shops and you know laundry mats and grocery stores and strip clubs and you name it. We've we've put them in there. Um, but the pattern is really convenience stores, gas stations, 24 hours with next to a traditional ATM machine sets you up for success. Yeah, it really, it really boils down to convenience and safety. People want to feel safe and secure and they, and they, no, there's no prying eye sitting there watching them use the machine, staring at them. Uh, they, they want to be, you know, kind of like off to the side in the back. Usually where you find ATMs in a gas station, that's a nice location. It's not up front. Um, those type of locations do great places like restaurants. We found that they don't really do really well. Why? Nobody wants to impose themselves upon eating. And when was the last time you said, Hey, I have to go, uh, hit, hit the ATM and Arby's. you run to Applebee's, right. you know, like you don't well, run maybe. to Applebee's to hit the right. ATM. <laughs> well, maybe you'll eat there now, but, uh, right. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, that is the point. They want to go in and out a convenience store. There's no expectation of anything besides you coming in and using the machine and leaving. And that's fine. Um, yeah. I think, uh, uh, an another thing. And I, and I've heard, heard about this is, um, it, the ease of getting, uh, like, like if you're in an area where, uh, people, there's not a lot of foot traffic on the street, but people drive there a major intersection where it's real hard to get into the gas station. That gas station may not be the best place. You, you, you park or you, you put that ATM one block away where it's easy for people to get, pull in and pull out and they <laughs> feel safe getting in there. That's a better location. So there's other things that you learn in the business as you as you go along. Yeah, that, that, that was another point I was going to make. Um, you mentioned about security and we had a location that was very doing very, very well. Um, and we had it right next to the ATM machine. We moved it to the front of the, it was doing so well, the store owner thought, hey, let's move this to the front of the store so people, you know, see it. And they, they well, it was a disaster because now people were like, I don't want, I'm putting in, you know, quite a bit of money and people are watching me and asking me why I'm putting so much money in this machine. You know, nobody wants anyone looking over their shoulder um, in front of register. So we ended up moving it back to the back of the store where it's, it is now and it's done very, very well. Um, but that was a learning lesson. We've done that a couple of times where we had to move a machine in the store because people don't feel safe in the store or skill games, right? There's kind of a seedy element to the skill games. So when you put them next to the skill games, they don't, they don't tend to do very well. So we have to, we, we've, we've moved them away from there. So that there's sort of a separation there. So people bring larger amounts of cash. Gun stores are a good, good place for people to feel safe, um, bringing in large amounts of cash, but that is a consideration. Um, uh, when you're putting it in is, but not all gun stores. You go to an, you're going to go to the ATM and pull it out. What's that? Not all gun stores. No, not, no, not all. Yeah. So, yeah. And when not all are safe or, or not all, or not all the, uh, yeah, that like it really has, it boils down to if you walk into a gun store and the, the owner is like, hey, what are you doing here? How can I help you? Uh, you're less inclined to want to go back there just to use a Bitcoin ATM. Whereas if you go into a gun store like, you know, that's got a, it's a big store <laughs> where there's a lot of shopping, <laughs> you can just walk in and out. Nobody's asking you any questions. All right. True. So, um, so moving on a little bit. So uh, for the people that just joined in. Yes, we have an agenda we've been following, um, and we had some questions that came in, so we're just addressing some of the questions that were relevant to our agenda. Um, you're welcome to go back and watch us from the beginning once we post. Um, but we were moving into, so the, the, the entire show is how to add a Bitcoin ATM to your business, and we were just about at the point where... Well, he just asked uh, a question that's actually locations. next on the agenda, so there you go. Ah, well, there you go, see? <laughs> see? How does, so how does the uh, Chainbytes dashboard help people with compliance? And then on the agenda is the importance of the dashboard for compliance. So, right, which uh, which we covered, which we addressed a little bit. Is that bit. somebody we from here? Or is, is this just okay? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So it's a little bit of uh, it's a little bit of blah blah blah. It's a little bit of a little bit of everything. So anyhow, um, so, so so how does Chainbytes uh, how, um, how does the dashboard help with compliance? Well, first of all, yeah. it tracks your customers, right? So when somebody comes up to the customer, it collects the information. Um, that you've listed in your compliance program. It stores that information encrypted securely, and then it provides that to you, your compliance officer, people that are uh, designated to review your transactions and provides tools to identify things in structuring 
Um, you know, it stops transactions. If people try to, you know, stay under the minimums to get through it, it will, it will identify that kind of behavior, put the order on hold, and then you have to clear it. Um, you can manage the phone call, literally everything you need to do in your compliance, your, your clearing uh, can be done from the dashboard. So that's how it does it. It does everything. Yeah, you see, <laughs> the the dashboard's actually really Except powerful. Except file the SARS and CTRs. I can't, I can't do that for you. But. The, 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 the dashboard's where everything happens with the Bitcoin ATM business. The only thing you actually do at your ATMs is manage your cash and your printer paper. Everything else is done from your dashboard. So all your ATMs, your ATM network connects to this dashboard. You can see each one of those ATMs. You can see all the transactions that happen on each one of those ATMs. It even breaks down and tells you what you're making in money from each ATM and every transaction. So it's that's where you, it's your hub. And that's where the whole business is centered around that dashboard. All right. Yeah, I mean, oh. so, so there's a summary page on the first part of the dashboard. You come in, there's a summary page. That's where you spend most of your time. You see all the latest transactions, the, your your wallet, how much is in there, the status of all your machines, whether it makes sure they're all online. Um, so basically everything's there. You don't have to do much of anything unless you notice something went offline or an order needs to be cleared. Then you have to dig into it, but it's all from there. And then you drill into it and there's, it's a pretty easy navigation system. Okay. Uh, somebody asked about the recyclers. Uh, what is an ITL recycler? How does it work? So, sure. So an ITL recycler is just that. It's a recycler. So what it, it can do is it can take the bills that are being put in and then recycle them and, and spit them out to the next customer. So you don't have to, in a traditional ATM, this is this is one thing that's that's a big difference and, and hard for them to, as an ATM operator, wrap your head around is that you're not filling this machine up with cash. You're always emptying cash out of this machine. So all the time before you were you know loading cassettes in your machine and, and, and now you're pulling it out. So what happens is the recycler can take cash and then somebody else comes up to the machine sells us bitcoin it is able to dispense that cash so you your cash starvation um is a little bit lower although i would say most orders are on the buy side so you still end up filling it up with cash but you never um you don't call the armored car service and have them come and deliver cash you have them come and pick it up that's what the, these machines are cash uh, intensive so your recycler is just that um you don't have to load up an acceptor and a, re and a dispenser is the traditional ATMs where you can dispense and receive it, and this it's all in one unit. Yeah, they, they the recycler holds a thousand and eighty bills, eighty bills on the drum, thousand in the cash box, but you're never going to let it fill up. Uh, usually, operators once they see that you know there's a substantial amount of cash in their machine, they want to go pick that cash up because now they got to get it in the banking system and get it back on their Bitcoin exchange. If it's sitting there in the machine, it's not doing it, it that, that whole process is stalling until that cash gets picked up. Plus, you, do, you don't want a Bitcoin ATM sitting there with, you know, $35,000 in it. Sure. Um, which actually leads us into our next uh, point was uh, cash handling and banking. Um, so which one do you want to start? Well, so let's start with banking. So first, first of all, banks don't like cash businesses. The, if you're in the ATM business, you already know this. You've already dealt with the banks. Um, you know, I, I've run ATM machines, and you know, every dollar has to. I, I got my one of my ATM accounts canceled for ten dollar discrepancy because I paid a service fee somewhere and it came out of the wrong account, and they were like, "Oh, your account's closed." I'm like, "What?" Like, it, it, so. Yeah, bank banking is an issue with the cash business. So um, that would be the first step. Um, you do that with you. You get a compliance program. Then you then you go to your a bank and you approach them about uh, a money service business uh, account. Um, and then that's where you get into the armored car service. Cash handling. There's two ways to do it. One, one is with the uh, armored car service, and one is you do it yourself. Most operators do it themselves. They go and they pick up the they they pick up the cash themselves. They deposit themselves. They do the whole thing. Until they reach a certain point. Once they reach a certain point, then you have the armored car service. Uh, you'll need special locks, so you should order them ahead of time. Make sure you get SNG locks or or Kabamas locks. Depend again what armored car service you're going to use. Depends on what kind of locks you're going to want to use. But most of them are going to use the standard SNG locks. Um, you get that installed, and then the armored car service will come and pick up the cash, deposit it into either your bank account or if you're using one of the um, cash services, their account. And then you get your uh, your Bitcoin. So, While you're on this, a question that just came in, it said, uh, why is an SMG lock important? And what is it? 
for aud- auditability. So uh, for Garda and on Dunbar and all these armored car services, um, they have a reputation. So they're going to come pick up your cash and it needs to be auditable. And they need to know that they picked up this amount of money and only they have access. You actually don't have access to your cash anymore. Once they have, uh, I can show it to you. Once they, once they put their code in, you don't even have access to your own cash. They do. So they know that anything going in there um, was picked up by them. So if you were robbed, it was by them. And so that they won't do it unless you have a mechanism like that. So they won't even service, they won't service the machines unless there's a, uh, SMG lock on. An, an auditable lock. Type auditable lock, right. Yeah. And each one, okay. of, I mean, I think they all take SMG, but um, some of them will take like Semcom, um, Kabamos, there's some other quote auditable locks, but SMG seems to be the standard standard lock. Okay. And I, uh, lastly, while we're on the subject, is how do the machines keep the money safe? Um, so there's, we a, talk about the, the there's multiple security vaults. Features, yeah. yeah. So there's multiple vaults. There's the main, obviously, the door to get into the machine, that's steel. Um, you know, we, we, we watched somebody try to break into the machine, but it, it wasn't pretty. Um, they couldn't get into the lock. They couldn't get into the thing. They ended up like cutting the front of the machine to, to get into the machine. Um, the, and, and they had all the time in the world. So there's nothing you can do about that. But so that's your first line of defense. Once, if they get past that, then there's an inner vault and that's again, steel. Um, and so they have to get past that as well. So they've gotten past the first. Then they get in that. Once they're past that, they pretty much can get the cassette, and there's just a simple lock on that. That you know, that, that's that's, that's going to be tough. if they got through the first two, they're they're in there. Okay. Uh, now you mentioned, um, you know, having uh, supply of Bitcoin. So the question that just came in is, do you? I want to get this. Uh, do you maintain a cash balance on the exchange? Yeah, you do. Well, you should. Um, and so you want to hedge your currency risk. As people are buying twenty dollars worth of Bitcoin, you want to be able to go to the exchange and buy that back at the lower price and lock in your your um, your profit so if the price of bitcoin goes up or down you don't care because you're always you know neutral with the amount of bitcoins that you have and you're always replenishing them at, at that price so if you maintain a cash balance on the mach- on the exchange you can tell the dashboard hey go ahead and automatically hedge my currency risk and and buy back my bitcoin on the exchange automatically and, and the system does that for you okay and and i suggest everybody do that a lot of operators think that they can play the market and you know Hope maybe, the price goes down maybe, later, right? Maybe, maybe you make more money this time and then you get burnt the next time. But um, I, I tell everybody they should use it. So, and for the people that are new that don't know, so that's it, uh, what you're describing. It's an automatic uh, buyback that's it, that's yeah. already built into the yeah, software. Yeah, they just go into the dashboard. They they put their uh, API for their exchange that they've gotten set up um, and then they just, you know, make it active. And then so as orders come into the machines, it'll automatically buy it back for them and they don't have to do anything. They lock in. And then also- Which is- for, for accounting purposes, now each line item is going to have what you bought it for, what you sold it for. So at the end of the year for your taxes, it's very easy. You can export it and you know what you um, what your gains were on each transaction. Whereas if you don't do that, you're, you can mark to market and, and take a fuzzy guess. But um, yeah. Okay. Which, uh, which hopefully answers the question that just came in, which is how do you, uh, how do you secure a steady supply of Bitcoin? But, yeah, but, <laughs> lots of different ways. So I mean, the main way is, is just the normal exchange, Gemini, Kraken, any one of the main exchanges. Um, you know, they're a little bit of a difficult to get set up with as a business, but once you're set up, um, that can be your main supply. There's partnerships, mining, uh, you know, you name it. There, there's lots yeah, of different o- ways. <clears throat> OTC that's, desk. <laughs> yep. That's, tr- that's the traditional. Most people do it that way, though, is through the exchanges. Okay. So for an operator, when they hear customer service and they're going to be spending time with customers doing customer service, what's the, what's the basic gist of, of, of what's involved with customer service for an operator? So I mean, we talked a little bit before like, about like what, uh, what are the questions they hear every day or, or like what, what are, so most, I guess most overall, the questions... like, so, yeah, so I mean, it, you know, is it someone calling in saying, uh, how do I set up a wallet? Um, a lot of it is that yep. question. Yep. Okay. A lot of it is, uh, um, you know, I'm new to this how do I, you know, what do I start? Like, I, I don't know what a Bitcoin wallet is. I can print one at the machine. Honestly, that's more complicated. So we'll, we'll try to get them set up on the phone with blue wallet or something very simple for them to use and have it um, accessible there. Um, that's it. And sometimes, sometimes people just have questions about uh, after they got the Bitcoin, like how to send it and things like that. So we, we do provide like aftermarket support and Bitcoins and stuff like that. Maybe we shouldn't, but some, some people take that a little far, but. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to help. Yeah, any, sometimes, we'll answer sometimes, anything. Bitcoin sometimes they related. hit the sell button and they're trying to buy and they, they don't understand. Yep, we get that why. a lot too. Yep. 
Yeah. yeah. And so they're like, you know, I, I, why is it not working? So you just have to set it. And you actually see, that, that's what's cool about our dashboard. You can see where they're touching on the screen. So you can see that they're, they're hitting that, they're hitting that uh, <laughs> sell button trying to buy their Bitcoin. And you just tell them, hey, hit the other button. <laughs> yeah, we have, what, what, he, what he's talking about is, is, is there's a thing called sessions inside your dashboard. And you, so you can literally see how the users are interacting with it and where they might be getting caught up. And like in the case here where that customer calls, I can see, well, you're clicking on the wrong button. You're clicking on the sell button. You want to buy Bitcoin. You don't want to sell it. You want to buy it. There you go. And then I can see that that's what they were doing and they were clicking on the wrong button. Um, so that's been very helpful in customer support because a lot of times what they think they're doing isn't what they're doing. Um, redeem. They're clicking on redeem voucher. No, you're, what, you, what, you don't have a voucher. But like, that's why. Okay. I don't, and, and then you're curious like why they think to click on that button. But You mentioned so, accounting. Uh Oh, no, no, I was just going to say, and so we're constantly improving the software where, where we find points that, you know, we try to keep it very simple um, so that they can get through the process very simply. And when we find points where people get hung up, like, like you said, that buy sell thing is still to this day, a major hang up like people, but I don't know what more we can do about that aside from educating them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two questions about the dashboard software. One, um, does it integrate with accounting software? Yeah, so we have, um, I don't think it's released yet, but um, we have an API integration with Zapier. Uh, so QuickBooks, Peachtree, all, all the accounting software can integrate in there. Uh, you can set it up to literally go transaction by transaction and put it in your accounting software, which we don't do. Um, but built into it today, you can export every month. So we have a, a revenue report that shows you what you bought your Bitcoin for, what you sold it for, the fees and things like that. And so you, you can just take that as a snapshot and export that monthly and make one line entry into your accounting software. But as far as a direct integration, yeah, you can put every line item if you want to into, into okay. the software, but um, that's a lot That's a lot of transactions. I, it, I don't think you need it, but it's there. But it's there. Uh, another question that came in regarding uh, customer service, can you set up user roles within the dashboard so that you can have another party handle customer service without them having full admin access? Yeah, there's a um, there's a read only access, I believe, right now, and then there's also one that we're building, um, which is going to give them just a view of some machines. So, like, uh, the, what, what we have is like some operators who are partnering with people, and they only want to give a sub a subset of machines. Um, that's not released yet. Uh, it's in the backlog. I'm not. Sure. I'd have to go look at when that's uh, due, but um, probably pretty soon, like within a month or so. Okay. Uh, another question regarding. Oh, the hardware itself, would it, uh, is there a warranty on the machines? And what if the machine breaks down? Yes, there's a uh, one-year warranty on the machines. Um, there's additional warranties uh, through the actual hardware manufacturers themselves. Um, as for the software, and as long as you're, you know, as long as you're in operation paying that 1%, you've got our customer support. But generally, there's only two moving parts for the machine. You have the recycler and you have the printer. Uh, the printer is, it, it's a thermal printer, so it doesn't require any ink. And those thermal printers, they last forever, uh, probably outlast me. Uh, as for the ITL recycler, uh, how many uh, bills does it recycle before it usually needs refurbished? Um, we got two in the room there. I think one did $4 million and the other one did $2 million. And honestly, they don't even need to be refurbished. So I don't know. Um, we're just doing it because they passed whatever that number was. Um, I, I'd have to look it up. There is a number. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think it's it. something I, I, like 20, it's like twenty three million dollars, one hundred dollar bills. So it's it's the number of units. Um, yeah. Know, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't recall what it is. Um, we have but, another. Oh, go ahead. Don't don't okay. don't worry. But the, but but when you hit that point, you made a fortune on that machine. It's it's uh, that took uh, that took about two years to get that machine like uh, and then we just swapped it out recently with a machine just mainly because of the locks because we wanted to put uh, the s g locks on that on that location um aside from that the machine could have kept running okay here's a question from um let me see if i got the name right it says satoshi nakamoto is there a limit on how much bitcoin a person can buy or sell at a machine i'm just kidding that's not really satoshi <laughs> not for satoshi you can buy and sell <laughs> whatever you want you want to <laughs> <laughs> you um <laughs> i'll buy all your bitcoin uh, sure no there's no there's no limitation um again that's your aml policy will dictate what you need to collect and and things like that um i can tell you that you know ten thousand dollars is that magic number of you know currency transaction reports so orders would automatically go on hold for that 
uh, because you need to collect additional information that you're probably not going to be collecting from all your customers. Um, but in theory, no, there's no limit. Fill it up. Okay. There's a question for uh, from somebody in California. Hey, California. Uh, are it, I'll just read it. It says, uh, are, are you guys licensed for smoke shops in California? So maybe I can go into compliance a little bit. I don't know that we need a, a special license to operate there. I know. Yeah, I don't no, think that you, I'm not. A, I'm not aware of any li any special licensing that a Bitcoin ATM machine would need to operate in there. Um, I mean, I can give you my personal opinion on that, but you know, there are definitely people operating machines in in smoke shops in in jurisdictions where it's. Yeah. Know, so so usually, uh, uh, traditional ATMs are in smoke shops for the fact that people can withdraw cash to then buy their product oh, in the smoke yeah. shop and but then they run into banking problems too <laughs> yeah yeah so i i mean like uh usually i hear about like AT, uh, bitcoin atms being next door at the cafe or you know across the street at the convenience store uh because then people are actually hitting all three places at the same time because it's right in the same area and that's part of the whole convenience and routine thing uh, what you're doing is your you know, your customers are based it, it, their whole uh, experience is off a of routine. So they might come to your machine once a week, but they've got a routine. Why, when do they come? They come the same time every week, the same day, and that happens to be the day after payday. And what you know after they went to the bank or after they you know picked up you know they're going to pick up pizza for the kids afterwards. So, you know, having it in a smoke shop, I don't think there's any special specific license that you need. But there is some things that you might want to consider, you know, yeah, like I don't, you, I don't, I don't like, I don't like them uh, for a lot of reasons. But one, I don't, I don't see them performing that well. You, you yeah. have really narrowed down who your clientele are going to be there, and people are not going to take, like you said, their kids. They're not going to bring their kids into a smoke shop. Um, they're not going to go in there unless they have a license. In, in some places, you need a license to go in there. Um, you know, they don't want multiple people to come in the store, so the dispensaries don't necessarily want the additional traffic. They want low key, so. There's other issues with it as well, and then, and of course, federally it's illegal, and you're regulated by a federal agency, so that's also probably not something um, you might be able to get away with it, but uh, not something I would want to do. No. Okay. Well, um, which leads into another question about uh, what's the best way to get more traffic in an area where there are uh, hundreds of machines already? Um, so, which is how, how do you stand out amongst competition? Customer support. Customer support's a big thing. Um, yeah, when you we, we just we just put one in a Mannheim, literally across the street from. I won't I won't say who they are, and we took all their customers. Like they nobody liked that machine, and as soon as another one went in, they're like, "Yeah, I'm never using that one." And we charge more money than they did. <laughs> so, yeah, I, 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 be, be, people people have so much time in the deck. They don't want to be wasting their time, and that time is precious. So what's your time worth? I mean, what, when it comes to me, I can, I can work on my own vehicles, but I pay somebody else to do it because I I'm better. I'm better spending my time doing something else. I don't want to waste my time. doing. It. I could be out there all day long working on my vehicles, but I pay someone else that can do it, you know, cost me more money, sure. but it saves me time. So it's the same thing when it comes to customers, customers don't want to waste their time. They want to be able to be in, be out, do their business, uh, they, they want it as easy as possible. And that's how we engineered our software. Take all the steps out as possible, make it as simple as possible so people are saving time. And people pay a premium for that. Sure. Um, sorry to follow up on his question. I, I was talking about weed shops. That's what I thought he meant by the, the, the vape shops. No, that's fine. We have them in vape shops all over the place. <laughs> Here in Pennsylvania, like half the convenience stores look like vape shops. So um it's hard to tell the difference anymore. Like they literally right across the street here, you walk in, they've got, you know, vaping paraphernalia. And I think they sell cookies in the back and it's a convenience store. But are you talking right. to the chat? Yeah. What's that? Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm responding <laughs> yeah, to what yeah, he's yeah, saying because yeah. he's, oh, like, yeah, he, yeah, he's yeah. telling me it's not federally illegal. It's like, no, it's not. I'm, I didn't mean the vape shops. Right. The weed yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing that you want to consider is, is regardless of where, you know, there's always these grandiose ideas and sometimes they work. But the bread and butter from a company that's been around for a very long time that has a lot of very successful operators that have been operating for a long time is consider your customer, whatever's a lot of money to you, whether it's five twenty dollar bills or five thousand or fifty, whatever you want to feel comfortable when you close your door in your car and hit the chur -chur, walk into the store that it's going to be a very simple process and, and in and out. And that's if you can put yourself in that mentality for your customers, you'll know where to put your machines. Well, we're happy to guide you, but uh, 
I mean, that, that's really where your bread and butter is. I mean, if you have a great spot where there's a ton of traffic, go for it. But like Eric said, and, I mean, you, you never know, really know. And, and, and there was another question earlier. How many machines should you buy? And and that's why we don't sell one off machines anymore, because you're, you're, you're gambling. Like you have no idea whether that location is going to work. You might think that is the there's been locations that I just thought were going to be fantastic and they were just OK. And locations that I thought would be whatever. And they turned out to be some of our best locations. Um, it's really hard to tell. Uh, what if no customers come to the machine? They move the machine. It's easy. Or you, like, or, you know, or 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 uh, there's other reasons behind. Or that. you're not doing like, enough marketing. There's a reason for it. Very very rarely do we even like we're not in the middle of nowhere. Some some places here, and people come to the machine. So it's really hard not to make money at a machine. I mean, there's very um, there was a gun shop that I guess you had mentioned that just nobody ever came to it. Uh, it was a small little gun shop, and that never had any orders. Besides that, like I can't remember leaving a location. What was the last location we left from? Yeah. Well, people have to know that your machine exists. So yeah. if you just plug in your machine somewhere and nobody know, knows it exists, then you're completely dependent upon the existing clientele of that business. So marketing is really a bit, it's a really an important part of doing, you know, if you reach a point, you're like, why am I not having enough business? It's yep. uh, one of two Probably things marketing. marketing or the location's just a bad location. Yeah, um, we, we found like locations that are, I can tell you bad locations are ones that have inconsistent hours. We've had locations just, oh, I decided to go home early and shut down. That's that's a big problem. You don't you don't want locations like that. That's why restaurants are, are notorious for weird hours, not being open on Mondays, not being open between these hours. And people just want to come and use the machine and not think about it. So that's why 24 hours, they're not going to come at two in the morning, but it's always open. So psychologically, um, those locations uh, tend to do a lot better. Hey, we got two questions that we missed, and I want to. Oh. I'll read them off, and I uh, and I'll give an answer. So it says, "I'm interested in a partnership. Are there any instances where you find the location in the partnership?" Now we do have a third party company that will help you find locations. They charge. I think they charge about a thousand dollars per location. It's honestly way easier to go out and actually find these yourself. It really is. It's not hard. A lot of people have to get over the hump of actually talking to people. You're you're going to be talking to these people one way or another. You want to give them money. It's easy. Really. You're going in there offering them money. They're not going to tell you to get lost. Um, so it's not hard finding the locations. Um, now, no. th and, and we but there, do but have... There are people that will do it for you if you need to. Yeah. Yep. And uh, there's... Uh, and there's do we do have operators that will, you know, that they'll do all the compliance, the Bitcoin, uh, the customer support. They do the cash logistics um, and they have like a partnership type program that they offer to, uh, you know, as like it's like a hybrid model. So, you know, and we're more than we're more than happy. Yeah, that, that model in. works good for people who have. Yeah, that, that model works good for people who have a couple of locations or maybe just one location. And, and, you know, if, if they're not going to do this as a business, it probably doesn't make sense to do it. Um, if you just want to have a, a machine, then it makes sense to partner with one of, one of these existing operators who, who does this all the time, um, mainly for the okay. compliance. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, like when it comes to the Bitcoin ATM business, it's a business and you have to focus on your business. If you want to be successful, then, you, you know, the people that are successful are the people that focus on, you know, it's, it's focus. They, they, they don't have three other companies that they're focusing on. They're focusing on their Bitcoin ATMs being, you know, successful. Uh, the other question is, I'm a, I'm an ATM operator. How do I transition? What are the differences between ATM and uh, ATM and bit, uh, BTM business? I need to think about where do I start transitioning? Well, you don't have to transition. They're, they're synergistic, right? Because people are going to come to your ATM machine and breathe new life into it because they're going to pull cash out of there and put it in the Bitcoin ATM. So you don't have to completely transition out of that old business, although you may want to. A lot of them, a lot of our ATM operators are like, I don't want to even do that anymore. There's like all that effort and all that work filling up the machine and all that stuff for peanuts compared to, to this. So um, you may want to revisit that. But uh, some of the big differences are Instead of delivering cash, you're picking up cash. Again, that's why it's synergistic. If if the banks, you know, if you didn't have to worry about the banks, you could literally just pull the cash out of one machine, put it in the other. But the banks are going to let you do that, so they're going to want to see you pull it out, put it in the bank, and, and go through the the round robin. And and then second to that is the compliance. On an ATM machine, you're not responsible for compliance. The bank is doing it. Everybody has a credit card or a debit card. Um, you're not responsible for compliance. You're not responsible for customer service. Um, somebody else is handling all that for you. If you're an operator. Uh, you will be responsible for all those things. And those are the main differences. Okay. 
And, and one thing that you can do as an existing ATM operator is use Bitcoin ATMs to complement your existing business or vice versa. So rather than getting out of the ATM business, you can stay in the ATM business and say to a, a gas station owner, landlord, look, we'll put a Bitcoin ATM and a traditional ATM in here. We'll have our traditional ATM with no fees. And that'll drive in high foot traffic coming in because people are going to want to pull cash out without paying a fee. And, and we'll pay you to put a Bitcoin ATM in here. That's like a win-win. How can your, your competition is just saying, hey, we're going to put a, a traditional ATM in here. You come in here and you're going to pay them more to put two ATMs. It's a, it's a no-brainer. And free foot traffic. I think, I think we're seeing that more and more now with, with our ATM operators. They're being asked, hey, do you have Bitcoin ATMs as well? So we see a lot of them coming to us and saying, okay, listen, I've had a new number of stores ask me about this thing. So um, what do I need to do to get involved in this? Um, and so there's a whole market out there for operators, you know, trying to help partner with traditional ATM guys to to get the machines out there. Um, I think some of them get started partnering and then they're like, oh, I think I'm I'm giving up a lot of money here. I want to do this myself. And then they end up doing it themselves. But um, partnering with someone isn't isn't so bad. Learn, learn the ropes. It's I'm going to put these two questions together because uh I think they go together. So the one question is, is there demographic data or market data to help determine uh, what areas to target? So, um, you know, uh, is there any data on crypto users that can help pick them? Where, where are also, ATM machines? What's that? Where are the ATM machines? I mean, th there is no demographic. Everybody who uses money, everybody. So th there sure. isn't like a specific set of people that are going to use this. I mean, if, you know, I got, we got one in, the near a truck stop we get truckers and so if you asked if i only had one machine and you asked me i'd be like oh the only people using bitcoin are truckers but i got a machine over with the hospital i got doctors and nurses oh i guess that's who uses it i got it in the local you know it, it really depends Everywhere. on where the machine is so. okay so and uh what are there, some there isn't a demographic that will make it unsuccessful yeah well, it, it, i i will say that you know like uh you're you're probably not going to be like I have a lot of customers that are like, I'm going to put this right in the center of a uh, really uh, like a tech hub, right? Now, those type of people, they're very accustomed <laughs> with computers and, and Bitcoin and exchanges. They, they're not actually looking to use a Bitcoin ATM. So versus, uh, you know, somebody that's of retirement age who, you know, they've, they might have banking but they've never really done online banking. And, you know, I have family members that have been in business for years and they've never done a bank wire. So all these different steps to get them in, into a Bitcoin yeah. exchange was like pulling teeth. And once they get to the Bitcoin exchange, it's over their head and they're like, it's just too much. Put cash right. in the machine, get in your Bitcoin <laughs> and going about your way is so much easier. So that's where the demographic we do know that works is you, you don't want to be targeting people that are real tech savvy. You put a Bitcoin ATM out in front of my house, I'm, I'll use it, but I'm not going to use it for most of my Bitcoin because I'm accustomed to, you know, I'm tech savvy. I, I grew up with computers. You know, I know how to get Bitcoin. So, you know, that's no, he's, what he's right. You would, you would think this belongs in like a, a hacker dojo or something. And no, they're, they're all online and clicking on it. This, this does better. Um, you know, a, a, a quick story. I was in one of the, one of the locations. Um, and this elderly man in a wheelchair was was near the machine, and I'm emptying out the machine, and he asked me about Ethereum, and I was lost. It I couldn't believe it. I was like, "What?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> and and apparently he had been using the machine and buying Bitcoin, but he wanted to buy Ethereum. And I'm like, "Okay." Like my mind was blown at at, at the fact that this guy had to been at least seventy years old, and and he's buying, um, and he's asking me about Ethereum. That's funny. That's a generation with money too. So. Right. So the bottom line is, is what, you know, while most people think that uh, this is, you know, this is definitely something for the younger generation. I mean, it, it, this is kind of, you know, I tread lightly when I say this. This is pretty much anybody that's just tired of holding dollar bills uh, and, you know, they, they, they want to go somewhere else. You this know? Is, this I is the I'm easiest like, hey, on they, and, and, and one of the people, right. one of the things people get caught up in on, on you know, Coinbase, Gemini and other exchanges is, is the AMLKYC is, is actually taking their pictures and putting it on and uploading it uh and doing everything with their tools that that's not something they do that's you know for tech savvy people that's that's easy for a lot of people that is beyond like that is so that's one of the things the machine does everything for you right you hold up your id to the machine it does it for you you're not you're not figuring out how to 
take your photo, email it to yourself and upload it, you know, none of that stuff. So um, that, that's definitely. A, a one and you, and you get, you take possession of your Bitcoin right then and there, which is an important thing. You know, your, you know, your keys, your Bitcoin. So once you buy your Bitcoin from a, from a, uh, from a Bitcoin ATM, you can do it whatever you want with it. It's yours. Whereas, you know, I have a family member who's been 11 months in support with an exchange trying to get the Bitcoin out of their Bitcoin account. 11 months. And like you said, you know, like keeps on, here's my passport again and again and again and again. It keeps on getting rejected. And it's a perfectly good passport. There's nothing illegal going on. It's just they've got 20,000 customers a day that they're trying to handle and they can't handle it. So with Bitcoin ATMs, it's more scalable. So, so that's, that's, that yeah. seems to be the demographic of the customer is, is people um, less technical, technically sophisticated. Who want convenience. They want to be in, they want to be out. These yep. are the same, you know, I, I, yep. that's all we're looking for. That's it. That's it. They just want to come in and out. I mean, here. when we did the interview with the news reporters, like they all opened, you know, one of the ba major exchange accounts. Um, one didn't get through it. She couldn't get through it. And, and when we showed them how to use the machine, they were just blown away. Like, this is so much. Why would I ever do that complicated crazy process of uh, you know this is so much easier and you know right. that's that's what we love to hear sure so what else fellas uh i think we've hit all of our uh yeah, agenda points. about cell, cell connections so same all as right. an atm machine if, if you can use what's what's there in, in place or you can use like an op connect cellular um connection it has ethernet it has wi-fi whatever you need um to, to do that we we typically will go into a location and try to use their their stuff we have reliable messaging in the machine so it can pretty much handle even really crappy networks um some of them are just so poor that they're out out of, for hours and so we just put you know our own cellular okay uh, what else Did we miss yeah. anything yeah there's a couple questions in there okay yeah, here's another. Uh, when we get to what? Go ahead. Now you go. Uh, when do you know if your uh, marketing agency is doing a uh, job well? Um, this is when, when when your machines are producing. <laughs> uh, when you see more people finding them. I mean, one of the things you want to do is ask, "How did you find my How did you find my machine?" You know, if you get somebody on the phone, why not find out how they found out about the machine? Because then you can actually you know, form a better marketing strategy yourself. Uh, most people market their machines themselves. So now getting on like Facebook ads and Google ads, that's not an easy feat. Uh, you'll have not to go for a crypto company or an MSP. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's really difficult and you will need connections through a marketing company to make that happen. Um, and you, you will not see as much as you will through efforts doing uh, guerrilla marketing, like having signs outside, and doing uh, vouchers and putting signs up for people to read, uh, come buy Bitcoin here. Um, those are really the most effective ways, and you, you'll see it in the numbers. Okay. Um, here's a question that just came in, and then we can move backwards a little bit. How much liquidity do you maintain in your hot wallet? <clears throat> Uh, it depends. So it depends on how many machines you have that you're supporting. So one hot wallet supports all your machines. Um, so we don't leave a whole lot in, in the hot wallet. We don't get, um, you know, we can always move money over to the wallet. Uh, so we typically don't leave a ton of money in there. I, I don't have an exact number. We kind of no, no more than a quarter Bitcoin, I would say, is do we hold in our wallet at any point in time? Um, and we just we're constantly sweeping it over if we need it. Yeah, and, I, and that's actually, that's for quite a few machines you got operating there. So most people yeah. think that you need a lot of Bitcoin. I, I talk to customers all the time. Well, you need, you like, need to be able to get it because you never know, right? But but yeah. it doesn't mean you have to keep it in your hot wallet. You can you can have it. And, and, like you don't, you don't, you don't need five Bitcoin to operate five machines. So, but you do need to have US dollars available on your Bitcoin exchange. So as you sell right. Bitcoin. I, and, and I think that's what Chris is. That's what yeah. Chris is asking about. So, so here, here's here's the formula for that. Chris is, is it's not necessarily your hot wallet. It's a combination of your hot wallet and your and the exchange and keeping U.S. dollars on the exchange. Um, you should have enough money between the two of them to handle how long it takes you to take cash out of the machine and get it turned around. So, seven days. So you should have about seven days worth of of 
of uh, liquidity uh, between your hot wallet and your exchange, roughly. The more, the better. I mean, somebody can come up and do a $20,000 transaction and you know, you'll, you'll be scrambling around. And if it takes you a while to, to take that money out and get it flipped around like that, you know, you, you need to have that capital uh, laying around, but you don't see those orders very often. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry about it, but I don't have an exact figure for you. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a customer who had a customer that came in and it was like $90,000 in 10 days completely unprepared for that liquidity. So then had to like go to the ATM every day, pick up the cash, get it back in the bank. And then have, you know, it, it was a nightmare. <laughs> and, and, well, it was, and a, it was a nightmare, I, but he was making money. Right. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good problem to have, but you know, that that's where you have to kind of figure You kind of, most of the time you grow into it. Um, in, in that case, he was just, it happened so early. That yeah, I know who you're talking hurt. about. He literally yeah. opened his machine up and the, the first night he got, I don't know. They were lining up. It was crazy. Yeah, I know you're talking about. <laughs> okay, let me have those. That, kind that, of does, that does not happen, by the way. That usually yeah. takes. So, so they didn't ask this question, but but how long does it take for your machine to ramp up and know whether or not it's a good location? Three months. That 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 is a number that we can use. So in three months, you, after you put that machine, you did your marketing, you did everything you're supposed to be doing, then you take a good look at that machine, and and in three months, you're going to know whether that location is going to be a good location or an okay location, or start looking somewhere else. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, yeah, that is that's a, that's the kind of nightmare I want to have. That's like watching Nightmare on Elm Street backwards. You know, it's like it ends up. Yeah, that doesn't good. happen very. That, um, that was shocking. Like what the hell? Like what? <laughs> I so thought he was the, testing the machine. Yeah, no, that was a customer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So usually the first two months are often slow, and that's because, like with any business, the first two months you're ramping up, you're marketing, people are walking by, they yeah. see that there's a Bitcoin ATM there, they're not quite sure if they want to try it out. Um, and you're building up your SEO it takes, it takes weeks to, you know, get ranking on, on, uh, search engines and getting your website built. So the first two months are usually slow, but every now and then it, it proves us wrong. And, you know, like it explode at a location. Yeah, we've, had locations right like that. we've had locations so, like we've never had an operator that did that though. Like where it was just like, he literally turned the machine on and, and they came in. We've had locations like that where we put the machine, you know, we put a location in and, and within days that machine was full. And we're like, wow, okay, you know, okay, this is, but normally give it a couple months. That makes sense. Gotcha. What else can we answer? Um, Do fluctuations in Bitcoin price impact the number of transactions you see on the machines? Is there a correlation between the price? So sometimes, um, not not like you would expect. Um, usually, when the price goes up dramatically, we see a rush on machines. Now, did that happen first? Did the rush on machines kind of coincide that you know the price is going up? Um, I don't know. I mean, we try to correlate those things, but it, it's hard. We don't we don't really see that. So the only the only thing we can definitely say is when the price shoots up and there's a lot of activity, which you know it's on TV, so it's it's not necessarily because the price is there. It may be because everyone's talking about it again, and now everyone's like, "Oh, it didn't die. Let me go buy some of that." I, you know, I swore I'd do it this time, and they do. Hmm. Uh, there's another. So no, um, we have no idea. Thank you. <laughs> what's the profit? Out, let us know if we can. We can what's the profit difference between an ATM and a BTM? Just go <laughs> Um. I mean, I can only give you like examples of where I've had ATMs and Bitcoin ATMs. It's night and day. Uh, so uh, I had one location, the ATM machine. I think I think we netted like two hundred dollars. Maybe not. It wasn't even two hundred dollars a month in that same location. We're doing uh, what seventeen percent of like like yeah, like fifteen thousand a month. So it's not even the same. Hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a big fifteen thousand profit, not 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 in volume profit. So here's some of these numbers. Um, here's a question that came in. So what's the minimum investment needed to get started? Well, your, your well, minimum investment is going to be like, you know, depends on how many machines you're going to get. Uh, we, we actually like to kind of like, you know, incentivize people to get five machines. Operators that get five machines tend to do pretty well. Uh, you got three machines, you pick the, the three bad locations, but then you got two great locations to take off. They, those two locations pay for all five machines which means that you see you're returning your investment quicker and you come back and buy more machines. You expand your operation. Uh, somebody that buy, like Eric had mentioned before, you buy one machine, you pick one bad location, six months into the operation, you finally feel, you, you finally find out, oh man, this location didn't work out. 
Now, now you're already six months in before you go and find another location. You might not see your return on your investment. Most people don't even do that. They, they just, yeah, they just give up. They, they just, yeah. and, and, and again, you're just starting off in your business. Of course, you're going to make mistakes in the beginning. So you, you made a mistake of finding the wrong location. You destroyed your whole business. It's, so, you know, I, I tell people a minimum of three, five, five is a good number. Um, I, I, I'd be shocked if you found, if you got three bad locations. Uh, yeah. You know, what and what is a bad location? Um, you know, a bad location is where you're losing money. I, I've never had a location where I actually lost money. Um, it's just, right. I didn't make as much as, you know, I, I figured I could put the machine to work somewhere else and make more money, but we never sure. lose money. Yeah. So a couple and, questions. And, and we, we will, we, we will pay for your compliance program and your MSB. So you get $2,000 off. If you actually buy five machines, that's how much we believe that five machines is the, that's the honey spot. If you want to get your toes wet. Mm -hmm. Yep. So these two questions I'll plow through. And then I want to spend uh, some time on this last one. And I don't know if you guys want to wrap up after that, but how long does it take to receive machines after placing an order? 35 to 45 days, cops worse, um, depending on, you know, how many we have uh, or how many you need. Um, and can you buy machines with Bitcoin? Of course, Bitcoin comes. <laughs> yeah, typically, comes. typically it's Bitcoin. usually about 35 days. Um, if we have them in stock, we can get them out sooner. So it, it can be as little as 10 to 14 days if we have them in stock. Uh, we don't often have them in stock because we sell out of what we have in stock. So it's usually about it's usually about 35 days. Um, we were okay. struggling for a while there with, with the delivery with DHL. Um, they, they could only pick up like 500 kilograms a day. So we were we were getting backlogged for a while there, but they've opened that back up. So those sort of issues we're not we don't yeah. see anymore. Cross our fingers. Again. Yeah, we we, we haven't had any issues anymore. Anymore. The the supply so, chain stuff is just ridiculous. But uh, I think I think hopefully it's behind us. So we touched on this, but I think uh, I don't think you can ever uh, talk about this too much or enough. Um, what are some of the most effective ways to really market these machines? So, so you have your business like set up. Signed Go ahead. Signage is the number one way. Absolutely. You put a sign out there like that truck stop I was talking about. We literally put a sign up. The truckers as they're driving by saw it. They heard about it. They know where they can go get it and they come back. And that's that seems to be a, a, a consistent pattern. We've done this in m numerous places. Billboard signage. You know, we put one in, in the front of the store. We put one in the store. We put one out on the street. We put one wherever they let us put one. Mm -hmm. And and that is by far the most bang for your buck. If they let us uh, you know, wrap, uh, put a, put a doll up there. I don't care. Whatever they'll let us do to attract attention, let people know they can buy Bitcoin there. People will come. Absolutely. Okay. And then you do your online marketing, but honestly, th that's not as much like the, the physical location marketing, traditional marketing is where you're really going to make a difference. Okay. And some people ignore that. They don't even put a sign in. I'm like, how do you think people are going to find the machine? Like, <laughs> stumble onto it there it is no you gotta let you gotta you gotta get it out there well i think that's what happens too is it uh you know there's these are not set up and forget it machines at all um so you you know the yeah. idea is drive as much drive as much traffic as you possibly can you know signage works tell people that you bump into in a grocery store walk up and down the cereal aisle 20 times and just bump into new people that, but... i'm just saying you know anything but, that you can do but you can have like traffic. meetup groups and you can bring people you can bring people in to educate them about bitcoin and then show them at the machine it's a great educational tool that's that's one of the things that we found is is you know partnering with the local meetups and things like that to show them you know how to use the machine okay another question came in about delivering the machines this is a, this is a Ooh, question how to move um, around. that I... is a good one Yes. Uh, should operators secure locations and have machines delivered directly there? And if not, are there any suggestions for moving them around? No, just like just like in your traditional ATM business, you don't ship the machine directly to the location. You ship it to your warehouse or your staging area like where uh, there. Um, you get it up and running. You make sure everything is fine with it. And then you bring it out there. Um, you can do it in a truck. You can do it in a, you know, a car. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's not ginormous it's heavy um probably better to have two people i've done it myself um and if you're going to really do this as a business to get a a little cart uh we can send you a link to a cart that will make your life way easier moving these things around um yeah okay but you don't need a u-haul we i mean if you're gonna do five in a day you'd want to get a u-haul to, to shop it around but you don't need it all right um 
think we hit all the questions. If we didn't, uh, no offense, you're welcome to contact us through the website, chainbytes.com. You can uh, contact us through the chat, call us, email us. Um, but I do, I'm scrolling through. I think we got just about everything. Well done, everybody. Great. We're happy to help. Um, Chris, we really appreciate that. People here with different ex- I was just going to say, we really appreciate the feedback. We, um, that's, that's what we're here to do. And, um, that's why we're taking the time to do this and we appreciate it. You know, we, we do this as often as we can. And, um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Any yeah, questions? We're going to edit it and post it up. So, so yeah, we'll have the recorded version up, uh, at some point in time. Just, uh, I guess follow, get, get it on our mailing list and, uh, we'll send it out to you when, when that goes out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and who to contact them, uh, for more information, go to chainbites.com. You can contact us directly through all the contact info. You can reach us. Well, you can chat with us on the website. We have, we have chat, chat with on, right the on the website as well. So you can just, yeah. yeah if they, you really need an answer quick, just go on the website and ask a question. So if, if you think of something later, um, just go on the website and, and feel free to ask a question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, uh, get getting on the phone is the best way to really learn this business because what you know what our sales team will do is we're, we're going to explain to you how these bitcoin atm machines work we explain to you the ins and outs of the business what you need to do for compliance all your cost uh what you're going to be expecting and you know you just can't get that through going back and forth through emails you can't get that on, on a you know a chat box it's a great way to get introduced to one another but it's a lot easier just to have a chat definitely and that's, uh, well, there's no, you know, we'll, we'll talk to you as long as we need to. Um, last question that I'd love to address, and you guys can answer this too if you want to. It says, uh, how much money do I need to start? And I'm going to tell you $20 more than enough. Because you always want to have an extra 20 bucks. Um, anything else? Yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, that, uh, everyone always asks that question. So three machines, what, 18000 I, I would say $25,000 is probably the minimum you need to get started. And that's probably... I don't know. That would, that would be tough. That, you'd be like that guy if it took off, running around p- pulling the cash and. <laughs> right. Yeah, you want to have a few. Uh, it, it might be know. tough, but uh, you know. That, Set yourself that... up. Yeah, gen- gen- generally, a lot of my customers that get like three machines, they're 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 getting the machines plus they have their cash and their Bitcoin, and they start with like fifty thousand dollars. So yeah, but you know. 50 is a good number they they can definitely you know the the problem is is like when, again a couple of these locations and, and you the operator you mentioned is what happens if somebody comes and buys like a ton and you, and you're you're cutting it close right and and that's a that's not a good yeah, thing yeah and you don't want to lose that customer no you of course want, not right that's your whale right and then you, you just right. lost that guy to this, somebody else so you want uh, yeah. those customers <laughs> yeah. definitely so yeah more is more is always better um i think a lot of these You'll see some of these machines that you're talking about where they put limitations um, on, on how much you can buy in a day, like $500 in a day. Um, what, what, why would you want to do that? Like, uh, yeah, and, and I saw a question about, you know, being there's so many other uh, large Bitcoin ATM operators out there. They have those restrictions. Yeah, they, yeah they're, restricting the, they're restricting how much you can buy and sell. Um, they, they, they're not, you know, per, you know, they don't have the customer support that you have. But, you know, what these large buyers, they want to find you and you're and they're not going to go over there. And, and plus you're buy and sell. So they, they have the option to come back. And that's a oh, huge, yeah, that's, huge, huge psychological yeah. element. Is, yeah, I hey, to mention that. That is that is something to mention yeah. is uh, how do you compete? These are all those are all one way machines. They're not two way machines. And so people want to know that they can sell when they find a two way machine. They always come back. We don't even sell one ways anymore. Um, it just never uh, there's no real cost savings. A couple hundred dollars off. Yeah, you can make up for that in one one transaction. Not worth it. Yeah, it's worth it, especially for the I mean, customers that have been using the one way machines. Yeah, I mean, for the customers that use one way machines until the day that their hot water heater breaks and they need to go hurry up and sell the Bitcoin that they've been buying for the past whatever. Um, they're going to go to the two way. Well, psychologically, machines. they'll say. psychologically they'll spend more money yeah. knowing that they can turn it around if they had to. And, sure. and that has been something like people ask us why, you know, most transactions, 90% of the transactions are by, why would I get a two way machine? That's why right. people want to know they can get rid of it where else. Cause otherwise what, what can they do with it? Right. Then where they got to go, go through right. some process that they avoided in the first place. They want to know they can get rid of it. So, um, that's yeah, I, I have a Bitcoin ATM story from uh, back in 2016, buddy of mine went, went to go sell Bitcoin and he had to drive 350 miles. 
to another Bitcoin ATM. And he was so upset when he went to the, the original Bitcoin ATM he's been using and he realized that he couldn't actually sell it there. So then he had to drive 350 miles to go sell his Bitcoin because he needed emergency money. And he's like, I will never, ever, ever use that company again. <laughs> and that was before there were a lot of Bitcoin, uh, two-way Bitcoin ATMs out there. You know, that that's, uh, you know, 2016. So it was a lot more one way back then. Uh, we see the industry. Well, there's a lot now, but that's that's only because there's a few operators that get the cheap, cheapo machines and put them yeah. out there. But, you know. Yeah. Right. And, and, that, and that, that's where we see the industry changing is, you know, the two way ATMs. Uh, we're, we're looking towards the future. We're not just looking into the past, what worked in the past. We're looking at, hey, how how is this industry going to continue to change going forth? And we see that happening. So hop on board. Contact yep. us. Chainbytes.com. Any other questions, let us know. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Mike. That's me. Um, see you, everybody. Thank you. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks.